I really want to uh, welcome tonight Gary Linkoff. He is not only the foremost mycologist in the entire world, in my mind, and certainly in North America, but he is also a philosopher. You may or may not know he'd never studied mycology formally. He has learned it all, so there's hope for all of us. But he studied philosophy, and what he brings to us is a crazy idea that the world and mushrooms somehow are connected. Please welcome Gary Linkoff. Thank you very much, and welcome to Telluride. Uh, let's see, before I begin, is there anyone here having a birthday today? <laughs> oh, we have someone here. <laughs> is that the art good times I met when uh, the 35-year-old I met back in 1981? <laughs> Yes, the same person. I'm asking that because I always ask who I am and if I am the same person I was when I came then and how many times I've changed since then and who am I now assuming that I'm an I. Because we've all learned that we're all we's and that we come with all of our microfauna and microflora and they all communicate to me unfortunately, at inappropriate times. <laughs> so those of you who were here last year, uh, you heard me under less than optimal conditions. <laughs> and I found, I have, I have discovered that under the influence of various things, in particular mushrooms, um, all my words become internalized. They don't find their way out. They go knocking around inside my body looking for a way out. And uh, last year they, they couldn't find it. But um, they're coming out now. So we'll see how far this goes. Um, so uh, since I, have been I was introduced or described earlier as the Triborough Bridge of Mycology, um, I, and since I hope some of you don't understand what that is, um, a bridge sort of between different fields, the field of mycology as a science, the field of um, the magic mushroom, and the field of basic mushroom hunting, and what amateurs do. I'd like to bring a little of that tonight to what we're talking about, and also to sort of use tonight's presentation, the Philosopher's Stone, as a kind of continuation of my talk last year, so that we can see where we've come since then, because a number of things have come out, have been published. Uh, we are a lot further along than we were just a year ago in terms of who we are and what we're doing and where the world is, and certainly in this country, in terms of mushrooms and our understanding of them, and also magic mushrooms, of course. But to begin, back in 81, we were primarily, we had two ideas then. One was to come and identify all the mushrooms here. And we were a pretty difficult group to deal with. We were, we were academic and we had microscopes and we played this role of we got to identify everything and we've got to scope it and we have to stay up until three in the morning and then we have to look at it all over again. I don't know where we lost that, but somewhere along the way, the microscopes didn't come out of the trunks of the cars, and um, Kahlua seemed to replace some of the <laughs> solutions we were using, and then mushrooms, sometimes in milkshakes, seemed to replace the Kahlua, and life went on. Um, anyway, what we did yesterday, we went out yesterday, a bunch of us, about nine of us, and we went to um, one of the areas near here. We're going to be going on walks tomorrow. If you have been to the display table, you know that there are a bunch of mushrooms out on display. We found about 50 different mushrooms in about two hours. And admittedly, they were not real big stick-in-your-eye mushrooms. They were Many of them were just coming up out of the ground. So you have to look for them, but they are there. 
And I mean, the largest mushrooms we found were the giant puffballs driving into town, which we ate last night. Um, <laughs> but the, um, some of the best mushrooms here, like the King Boli and like the Chanterelle, and we even found a Matsutake yesterday, and we found a few coral clubs, and these are all choice edible mushrooms. And then one of my favorites here, the genus Russula, is uh, one of those mushrooms that almost nobody picks, and it's generally thought of as an inferior food, and so no one bothers eating them, and if they do, they don't usually like what they get. And you're, one of the things you're taught in terms of identifying mushrooms, if you think you've got a Russula, you throw it against a tree, and it shatters, and then bingo, you know the genus. Well, one of the mushrooms out here happens to be one of the, easily one of the 10 best edible mushrooms in America, and it's called the shrimp russula, russula zarampolina. We must have found 30 or 40 of them yesterday, and they went into a pasta last night. People brought in bags full of them this morning. So it's a red russula, but that's not the end of the story, and you'll hear about that tomorrow in terms of identification. But it is a russula that has a very distinct fishy odor that tastes really good when you cook it, and it's the, probably the only safe seafood tasting dish you should have in the mountains. <laughs> okay, so, so we found all those mushrooms, and we're going to be doing this tomorrow, and I hope you're going to come out on the forays. There's plenty of them scheduled. There's more than enough for everyone to go on, uh, depending on what time you get up. You don't, there's no one foray that's going to be the best. There's no one foray leader who's the best. It's just the luck of the draw, whatever you happen to find. And some people are going to come back with more mushrooms than others. But what we do is we take them all down to the display area, and the point is we get a chance to sort everything and look at everything, and the edibles then can be um, gathered and we can cook them, and preferably not the poisonous ones. So. Some of you have some interesting ideas about what the names of some of the mushrooms are that are here, and they're very creative, and we're going to try to talk about why they're not those things. <laughs> so, um, now tonight, um, how many of you, by the way, have your copy of Fungi Magazine, the new issue? Okay, I mean, I, I could stand here and read it cover to cover, um, I could just read my article in here, um, which includes the description of 11 different trips I've had around the world on various substances uh, that many of the people in the audience here tonight shared with me. But I'll let you have the pleasure of reading these, I hope, uh, yourselves. But what we're going to do is talk about a number of things first to get, get you in the mood for this talk, which is the Philosopher's Stone, or how you can save tens of thousands of dollars in therapy. And also, um, what was the other part of that? <laughs> help keep you out, break, help you break out of the prison of time and space. I kept, I, I had another couple sentences there, but it was getting a little long. Anyway, if you happen to go to Amsterdam, this is what you can find in the markets, at least the one on the right, which is called Dragon's Dynamite. And in the, whichever one, the one on the left is no longer available in mushroom form, but this is Psilocybe tamponensis. It's the mushroom that Steve Pollock and I found in 1977 at a conference in Tampa, Florida, where there were 1,200 professional mycologists, some hippie in the parking lot, this bearded hippie said to me, what are you doing, he didn't know me, he said, what are you doing in there with a tie and jacket on, uh, why don't you come out and we'll go hunt, my hunt mushrooms? And I didn't have any good reason not to because that's what I was there for and the people indoors weren't interested in hunting. So he said, just make sure that you bring your badge with you of the conference, and we went around to pastures, and um, <coughs> eventually we found these mushrooms. All the mushrooms, all pastures in Tampa had mushrooms, but we found this one mushroom, which 
Steve then grew. By the way, there's a really nice photograph of Steve Pollock in the new issue of Fungi, um, which Steve grew and discovered that it had a sclerotium at the base of it, like a, a false truffle, but compacted mycelium. And that instead of having to grow mushrooms, you could just grow this truffle-like device, carry it around with you, and offer people a slice now and then, which he did. And he called it a Rock of Ages. And he went to a number of forays for uh, a few years after that. The mushroom then disappeared and had no idea what happened to it. I never heard of it again until people said, you know, they're selling this strange thing in Amsterdam. Have you ever heard of this thing? And it turns out they have the culture and they've been growing it and now they're selling it. It still isn't a really good thing to carry around in your pocket in this country. On the other hand, um, how many people can recognize you know, a, a, a pebble from a mushroom. And after all, it doesn't look like a mushroom. So I'm going to talk a little bit about this, but first to get you started, I want to show you some things from last year. Those of you who have never been here before, this is the parade that comes on Saturday. Get your costumes ready now. This is a big event. Um, and these are just pictures of Telluride. Oh, if you're looking for mushrooms, how do you look for them? Preferably with other people, because if you don't know where they are, other people may find them. And it's like a gold rush to some extent, especially if what you're looking for is chanterelles. Are you going to come with your gear intact, like Linnea on the left? I don't know if that's a good picture. Um, she has all of her wax paper and her collecting container all on her body. Or the woman on the right who found her collecting container in the woods and could hardly lift it up. This piece of metal. We found mushrooms like this, the fly agaric. And if you follow these mushrooms, it leads right to the witch's house. I don't know how many of you also can see in that picture, there are some other mushrooms in that picture that are round and sort of brown. Those are the bolitas, the king bolit. And this is the mushroom we often use to fi help find the king bolit because this one's so bright and conspicuous. And that is the king bolit on the left and the chanterelles on the right. Okay, I was in New York City this summer and I was taking a group out and someone brought these mushrooms for me to look at and said, what do you think these are? And it was this rather large, it was a three to four inch high mushroom with a two inch, three inch cap and it was bluing with brown gills. What else can it be but a psilocybe? So it turns out it's a mushroom described from Pennsylvania and according to someone out there, it is the second most popular mushroom now in that whole area, the most popular being the morel. But people are finding this in wood chip mulch. I put it in the grass for the photo. It's growing in by the dozens and hundreds and thousands in wood chip mulch. And so the person who brought it, and I talk about this in Fungi Magazine, the person who brought it said he was really interested in taking it, but he had never taken a hallucinogen in his life. And he was not really interested in hippie stuff. So I said, well, then, you know, just study it, look at it, learn it. And he said, okay. And um, he calls me, and this is a friend of mine who is in incredible pain. This is the kind of pain where you have to take opiates just to be able to walk. So he has knee pain and hip pain, and obviously there's going to be an operation in the future. But he's been taking these opiates, and he said he's rarely ever pain-free. So one night, he had this collection of mushrooms. He said, what have I got to lose? He takes the mushrooms, some time goes by, he calls. I've got to tell you what's going on. He's alone. It was 
never a really good idea to do this by yourself. He's alone. He's also on the seventh floor of a building. Not, in that, not a good idea. Um, he said, my room, oh, oh, my room, it's getting really big. He said, no, 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 it's getting really small. <laughs> and he said, I'm, I'm dancing. I'm dancing. Can, can you hear me? I'm dancing. I'm dancing around my apartment. He said, I haven't been able to move like this in years. He said, what do you think? It's the mushroom. He's, and he had found nirvana. And so I said, okay, we got to talk tomorrow. I said, in the meantime, stay away from your window. <laughs> And we talked the next day, and um, he said, oh, it was the most incredible experience. And he had, he said, no pain. I said, how are you now? He said, oh, don't ask. Um, it all came back, you know, pain and all that. So he tried it again, and he tried it a couple days later, and he said nothing happened. So he thought somehow he had blown his wad. He couldn't get it anymore. So since I didn't know he had hundreds of these, I thought he only had the collection that he showed me. He tried it again after a week or so. And nothing much was happening, so he tried some more. Same thing, he had this giddy experience, no pain, and this ability to feel really like light on his feet. And he's had this several times now. Knowing that he can bring this on himself and using a, a hallucinogen that he never believed, first of all, in the value of, and never being someone who even thought highly of people who used them. Here was someone who was now a, now a committed user of this stash he has. Um, so when I asked him to share his um, location with me, he said, uh, Bronx, New York. <laughs> I said, gee, you know, thanks a lot. He said, well, if you look, you'll find it. Okay, so uh, if you read the article that was in the, the new issue, current issue of The Watch, there's an article there by Gina Bone. Um, she writes about someone who has cluster headaches. We talked about this last year in Telluride. Since then, a number of doctors have criticized the use of mushrooms um, without double-blind studies to be sure that it's actually doing anything. Well, read the article because Gina discusses someone who is a sufferer of cluster headaches. And if you don't know what this is, you can go to clusterheadaches.com, read all about it. If you don't have them, good for you, but you probably know someone who does. Anyway, it, may, it totally immobilizes you. And so this person said that um, under the influence of a small amount of this mushroom, he is able to intercept the onset of the cluster headache. Now, this is purely anecdotal, but it's building. That is, there are so many stories coming out now. And I think part of it is because partially the Johns Hopkins study is allowing people to talk more openly now than they ever could before. And there's, we're, we're getting to the point where we're going to be getting a, a measurable effect just from the openness of the discussion. So that if, if, if Johns Hopkins study does nothing else, it has opened us up to, to be able to talk as a society about what things are actually helping us and how they're helping us instead of the old sort of uh, discrediting something because there's no study to prove that it does good. So this is, this is something, a really big thing that's just come out in the past five years. So I was at a conference last week. When I go to mushroom forays back east, one mushroom foray is like being in the middle of the Eisenhower administration. <laughs> it's hard to even talk about it. Yes, there's Elvis out there, but boy, you can't even hear them. Um, these people are just so focused on the little narrow way they can view the world that it's really hard to open them up. And for example, one national, the National Mushroom Society, doesn't really encourage 
talks on magic mushrooms. Um, they are sort of, if you, don't, if you don't mention them, somehow they'll stay clear of them and no one will suggest that they somehow are involved in any way. And so they're sort of the 800 pound magic mushroom in the room. Um, but here we were last week and we were in the Adirondacks for the Northeast Mycological Federation 4A. And this is what I was seeing. These people are not looking for contact lenses. <laughs> First it was just a couple and they were young in their early 20s. And then it was a few more people and then a few more people. And then I gave a talk there on magic mushrooms because they said there was, there was a stirring in the crowd that they wanted to hear about these things and they trusted me. <laughs> After my talk, I'd say there were 150 people in the lawn looking for those mushrooms. <laughs> and unfortunately, if you don't train people, they step all over them. <laughs> but they were these, uh, that's a good picture of that, these two little mushrooms that are coming up in grass now in vast numbers. And one of them is Canossaby smithii on the left. It looks like the dunce cap, except that it's a, a brown, mostly dark brown capped mushroom and the stem bruises blue. 300 were found at this last this conference last week and six were put on the display table. <laughs> the other mushroom, the one on the right, is a look-alike for a really common grassland mushroom that everyone I think knows called the, the lawnmower's mushroom. What, one name for it is Panialina fenisecii, but if you collect it and you actually look, turn it over and look at it, its look-alike has gills that are black and it has gills that are sort of dark brown. And you say, well, that's, can you tell the difference? Well, you can make spore prints, which we'll talk about tomorrow. And the spore print of the fenisecii is dark brown and the spore print of this Panialis cinctulus is black. And once you know that, what do you know? Well, the one on this mushroom on the right turns out to be psy another psychoactive grass inhabitant. And what's cool about these mushrooms is they do not stick up above the grass. Maybe they have evolved to be below the cut of the, of the lawnmower. <laughs> this is evolution in action. They are saying, we recognize a new herbivore <laughs> chomping around and we're not going to let them get us. And so these things are only an inch and a half or so above the, uh, above the ground, lower than the, the grass. You have to stand staring straight down at the grass to see these things. So we may have them here. And we, since we have not been really doing lawn crawls, we don't know. <laughs> but if we, should we get that heavy rain that's been promised, Saturday afternoon could be a lawn crawl. <laughs> Certainly Sunday morning. All right, then, where do I learn all my mushrooms? How about a Central Park Ranger who says, I think I got one, and he is interested in showing me where he got this, and this is the big laughing gym. I said, you know these mushrooms? And he said, yeah, he said, um, we're really interested. We have this, this book called The Audubon Guide and we, we're trying to identify mushrooms. We think this is a good one. Right. So um, it turns out that the, there's a little cadre in the among the rangers that feel that this is a perk of their job. <laughs> they don't get paid very much, but on the other hand, they get 800 acres to walk around and there's a lot of mushrooms when it rains. So this is the big laughing gym. We'll talk about that another time. But come back here. When you go to the, uh, the display area, you will see either um, Bill Adams on the left, or you'll see Linnea Gilman, you'll see me. And what we do is we have you bring your mushrooms, we put them out, we look at them, we try to identify them for you. So don't just drop them. Stay. Learn something. And you may only want to know what's edible. So you may have to listen to us tell you something you don't want to know, like an unpronounceable, unmemorable name. Like, do you really need to know Catathalasma Imperiali? 
You know, can't you just say big cat and so what? Because you'll see that the labels on the display are green for edible, red for poisonous, and black for mushroom. Meaning, well, we don't really know much about it. Do you want to be the person that tells the world? <laughs> they would put you on the front page of the watch if it, if it doesn't work. All right, so people came in last year with baskets like this. Nice mixed collections with the orange milk lactarius, with some bolides, and with the fly agaric, all mixed together. That must have been quite a dinner. Uh, not something most of us would do. We're going to try to convince you to separate your mushrooms when you put them in your basket. Maybe just to keep the good edibles separate from all the others which you'll hear more about this weekend. Okay, then we have the leader of the band, who is, you know, fortunately, now I know why Telluride was a week earlier this year, so he could have his birthday during the festival. <laughs> That's okay, I understand. Good, mine's in October, we'll just come back. And then, of course, we have the, the drummers, and this is an, an a, really has been an incredible, incredibly important part of this festival, listening to the drummers, because it, they drum for an hour or two and then you hear it for a week or two. <laughs> and then we had costumes, we had a mushroom parade, and these two people from West Virginia won the, I think, the most creative costume award last year. They were dressed as, what else? Destroying angels, which is, if you don't know, that's the name of the common white deadly mushroom, deadly amanita. Um, then we had Manny Salzman with his mind medicine, because we were talking about that, and of course, John Sir Jesse looking like he needed some. <laughs> and then we had some other people like um, Dr. Joel, um, think, looking very much like a witch doctor. I don't quite get that yet, but okay. And, um, and then um, Gina Bone, who came dressed as the picture that is on her that she's wearing, but she was afraid no one would recognize it, that people wouldn't know this classic photograph of this 1912 photo of a, a woman dressed all in black holding a mushroom. So she came as that reincarnation of that woman. And then we had a number of other kinds of people with really creative mushroom costumes. So you could spend hours making costumes between now and Saturday. Um, but of course, you're, you're going to be so busy during the day that you can't do it then. So you'll have to do it from midnight to 7. But you should do it in two days or less. And then we, sometimes we, we celebrate by announcing someone is the king or the queen of the festival. And this one, we had Rita Rosenberg, who took her job a little too seriously. We had three beheadings. <laughs> and then we have, well, we have to discuss the parameters of being regal. Um, so we had a, then we have a feed some years where you have no idea how many mushrooms it takes to feed a group and how many hours it takes to find those mushrooms and to clean them. Um, many of us are, no matter what else we do here, we love to eat mushrooms. And they're almost, it's almost as much fun as finding them. And so one of the things we will be doing is looking for edibles. So we implore you to find them, help us find them and bring them in. Some of you know what they are and you can bring in the clubs and the and the shrimp russulas. I don't expect you to share all of your chanterelles with us, but 80 or 90 percent would be nice. <laughs> and then you know Brit and Fungi Magazine, which you will now get when you leave the theater, if you haven't already. This could have been done in a splash of a second, in which case it would have been subliminal and you wouldn't have known what makes you buy it. Then there's the movie, and if some of you didn't already see it today, you can see it tomorrow evening, I, later tomorrow, and this is Know Your Mushrooms. Uh, is there anyone here who still hasn't seen this movie? Um, it's, if you just seeing it is not enough, 
you have to own it because you, every time you feel low, you have to put this mushroom, this, this movie on and it's legal. So that should there be a raid, all you've got is a movie. <laughs> all right, so Philosopher's Stone. So here's this mushroom that we found that Steve and I, I told you about that we found. And what is a Philosopher's Stone anyway? And some of you know if you look it up on the internet that it's a legendary alchemical substance said to be capable of turning base metals, very various, various things, into gold. Well, what is it that mushrooms can do? And what is it that we want them to do? And is it that we just want them to make us feel good and be a substitute, let's say, for coffee or alcohol? Is it just another sort of substance? Or do we want to do more with it? Are we looking for something more? Are we looking for something that we think we can really get with, under the influence of the mushroom? And is there a reason, that's another issue we can't really discuss tonight, why we are so responsive to something like these particular mushrooms, especially the psilocybin-containing mushrooms. Anyway, apparently in England, this was called Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. That's not what they call it here, if you read that series. So what do you do with this stuff? Well, you take the mushroom and you can read various stories about being under the influence if you've never done this. Um, you can hear all kinds of accounts. You may have stories of your own. How far can you take this in terms of personal development? I get into, um, I think ever since I was 16 or 17, I would assume the persona of somebody else for a period of time. Um, never Jack the Ripper, but once it was, it was Henry David Thoreau. And I was Thoreau for a, a good part of a year until my family couldn't take it anymore. And, um, and then I, since then I've, I've um, become various philosophers when I was in school. I became various mycologists. I would try to behave like I thought major mycologists would behave. And I would say, well, if I were Alexander Smith, this is what I would do, or this is what I would say. And I would carry it around for, with me for a while. Recently, as I realized I'm changing in all kinds of ways, I started wondering about what if you looked at what psychology has to say about not mushrooms, but us, who we are, who we think we are, who, where we came from, what we want to be doing with ourselves. And one of the things you, if, if you happen to read any Freud, mostly we don't read him, we read about him. Um, this, is, this book may not be very good, Civilization and Its Discontents, but one thing I really liked in it was his absolute dismissal of what he called the oceanic feeling something almost all of us experience and do not interpret as infantile regression. That is, we get this sense that we are all part of one, that we are one with the planet, we are one with other people, we are a unity rather than a diversity that has no way of connecting. Most of our workday world is to make, keep us anxious and to keep us separated and to keep us competitive and to keep us essentially hostile aggressive so that no one should get anything more than we get or get something we should be getting or whatever. And the news, the TV news makes you feel like this every night when they tell you about the stock market or whatever or what gold, you didn't buy gold when it was $32 an ounce? Where were you? Uh, so it, you're made to feel this you know, totally incapable, incompetent person, Freud would approve, I think, of all that and say, well, like, get on with it. That's life. What do you expect? Well, we know that there's another way. And part of it is a political way that is something I don't think I have time to talk about tonight, but would be willing to discuss at length if you are interested some other time, is that I think that 
We could not understand the oceanic feeling. We couldn't understand symbiosis or the, even the, the, the bringing together of multiple parts to make a whole, like there is no such thing as a tree out there. Trees are conglomerates of the tree you see, plus all the fungi in the soil, plus all the fungi in their tissues that you can't see, so that it's not an entity, it is a really a consortium of organisms. We couldn't see that, and Lynn Margulis, who was here a number of years ago, argued that the reason we couldn't see it was because the Soviet Union had made anything that re remotely resembled socialism anathema to any American. So you couldn't talk about this. Michael Rizzi didn't really, even though the study had been known for decades and decades, it didn't really surface in big time until the past 20 or 30 years. So we are in a place now we couldn't have been politically at a time when we needed to have a competitive understanding of life as opposed to a synergistic, um, a, a kind of a symbiotic approach to life. So one of the things I wanted to know was, you know, is, was Freud alone in this? Weren't there other people who believed that you could have this oceanic feeling? Was it all, you know, was it Freud and no one else? Well, there were other people. So I became a Ronkian for a while. And I believed, I found that I don't get very far with my friends when I ask them to discuss their birth trauma with me. Um, because it's sort of like, you can't do it over breakfast, and there's, you don't do it over drinks, because they can become really touchy about these things, like they don't even know what I'm talking about. And I said, well, you know, you don't realize that all your current unhappiness comes because you were thrust out as, a, as an infant? And they're just like, what? <laughs> I said, you mean you weren't? How did you get out here? I mean, the stork? I mean, many of us have that. But that's, you know, so I'm, I'm reading that now, and I keep rereading it, and I keep thinking. I even wondered, because our son is a C-section, and I thought maybe he escaped it, and he didn't have the trauma. But the trauma is not going through the birth canal. It's just coming out. And it's like, oh my God, there's no way out of it. We're all, on, we're all in the same boat. So I thought, okay, this is it. This is birth trauma. If I can get that down, I'll really understand why I am the way I am. I'm a Ronkian. Well, um, well there's more to it. Sandra Ferenzi is another, my, another psychologist back in the day, and he had a real strong belief in what it was like or what it would be like if you were back in the sea that we came from, the amniotic fluid. Okay, there's very little, it'd be very hard to have a conversation with David Rose if you are in the amnion. It's, it's, pre, it's pre-verbal. It's, it's not even something you can even verbalize. And then you find out that there is the Jungians, and I'm many, many of you here are probably Jungians or believe you are, and there are these archetypes. Where did they come from? Because were we born with them? Were they in us before we were born? And these are questions that only, you can only answer on five milligrams. <laughs> so last year we talked about, the, and some of this is in the new um, Fungi magazine, the 1957 issue of Life magazine where Gordon Wasson talked about um, going to Mexico and finding Maria Sabina and having the experience which then led to uh, decades of use and abuse of that part of Oaxaca and also a lot of people who then either went down there and to take the mushroom or since then. And if some of you were here last year and you hadn't been to this conference, in April of 2010, there was a MAPS conference in San Jose. And I believe all of the programs on that conference are now on YouTube. So there's hours 
if you have the time and the interest, hours of uh, YouTube lectures that you can hear um, right now that are available, including a number by, um, it's not one by Andy Weil, by a number of you know, major speakers and, and researchers in the field. And then this is the magazine that came out after Telluride last year. It's the, the Scientific American of December 2010. And the article in there, which is, I find astounding, it says on the cover of it, psychedelic cures. Whoa. Psychedelic cures? And then you look in the magazine and you find out there's an actual artic article here about how you can cut through a lot of this therapy. You don't have to go to a Freudian or a Ronkian or a Forensian or who, uh, Jungian. Um, you can just maybe work with a therapist who uses psilocybin. And this is what they're doing now. And some of it is very promising. Maybe not for where you are in life at this moment. But, for example, if you are in an end-of-life moment, this might be the way to go. Um, I'm putting my name down, just in case, you know, that should happen. I want them to know I'm, I'm, I'm there. Um, people who are going through a whole variety of dysfunctional behaviors are being treated now very carefully with measured amounts of psilocybin to find out if it does good. This is important because if we don't get this out there, then the only thing the media has is this other image of psilocybe, which is usually kids getting stoned and somehow being seen, and the whole thing ends up in the press. And we want to put a positive, a positive sense of this out there. And one way of doing that is trying to bring the establishment into it in a, in a way that benefits us collectively. If you are into science fiction, you know that last year's science fiction is this year's science. Well, first I saw this movie called Altered States. I don't know how many of you remember it from the 70s. It's a crazy piece of science fiction. But Patty Shaevsky wrote something that could just as easily have been, let's see if I have this next, a Stanislav Grof description of genetic regression. That under the influence, in this case of a mushroom, but totally science fiction in altered states, the hero reverts to the physio physiognomy of a gorilla for a limited period of time. You wouldn't want to experience that. However, genetic regression is something that's out there and being discussed. And one particular therapist, Stanislav Grof, is very interested in the possibility of not only knowing who we are, not from the age of three, which is generally where I, can, I can't remember earlier than three, but even before birth, not the trauma, not even that nice feeling of being in that nice, warm, amniotic fluid, but before, before other lives. This gets difficult to discuss sober. So I suspect this is something we have to postpone until later. But any of you who are interested in knowing about your former lives, if there may, be, may have been many, if you would like to know what it would be like to have been, maybe you have been, another species, and you would like to re-engage that other species, encounter it, this may be a way of doing it. I'm not suggesting it's going to work, but it's not something out of the realm of at least imagination, if not possibility. So where are we and where are they? Do you know where you are on this map, which is not labeled? Do you know what areas you can expect to find psilocybes or mushrooms that are psychoactive? When Gaston Guzman wrote his book, The Genus Psilocybe, which I think was, came out in the late 80s, 
There was lots of white space on that map. Now, if you were to put a, a, a red spot for where all the psilocybes have been found, all the active psilocybes, you'd be surprised that they are almost everywhere. We found them in, in southern India. We found them in North Africa. We found them in Australia and Tasmania. Um, we, even, we even ate them and even ate the type collection. We even lost some. Uh, there's still some out there to be found. In South America, there are... Uh, quite a few, especially in northern South America, and we know where they are in North America, um, and they're all through Europe. And these are things that, were, that are out there, and they're little brown mushrooms, and they have a worldwide distribution, and very few professional mycologists are studying them, which is another reason why this conference is so important, because it's one of the few places that we can discuss this Paul Stamets has this wonderful book on Psilocybe Mushrooms of the World. If you don't have it, I think it's out on the outside. By the way, there will be a book signing after this program, and I was told I can't sign every book on the table out there, only the ones I've written. But if you, <laughs> if you ask, I will. So to finish up, um, This is Manny Salzman, and this is his costume for a couple of years ago. So you don't have to spend the next two days thinking up a costume. There will be signs you can make and walk around and hold up. You can put mushrooms on your hat. You can wear mushrooms on your ears. You can use mushrooms as castanets. Um, there are lots of different things you can do. You just have to think what it will be when you are photographed wearing whatever it is and shown here at Telluride next year. Thank you very much. There is a book signing right outside here, uh, and somebody <clears throat> lost a little wallet thing, so if you have it here. The uh, forays are going to start at 6 a.m. at Elks Park, a sunrise foray. At 8 a.m. in Elks Park, there'll be an early bird, and then we'll have tomorrow's forays, the regular forays at 10.30 here. I think Katrina Blair is also going to do a wildcrafting foray. So lots of choices. Let's see you out there.